Okay, <laughs> so um, as Iona said, um, I'm going to be talking about waterfalls um, this evening. So I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Liverpool. Um, so my project um, is working with Cheshire Wildlife Trust, um, but also I'm, I've got some data from Record and I'm working with um, some other funders, so um, including NERC, so Natural Environment um, Research Council, um, to investigate um, conservation genetics for waterfalls um, in Cheshire, but hopefully um, my research will enable some further research across the UK as well. So I'm going to start um, right at the beginning with what a waterfall is. Um, so for those of you who've never seen one, you might not have been able to see one. Um, they look um, from a distance similar to rats, but as you can see in this photo um, down at the bottom, there are a few key differences. So waterfalls have slightly blunter face, um, a shorter tail, um, but they occupy a lot of the same kind of areas as rats might do. So they're a semi-aquatic mammal. They do spend a lot of time um, on land as well as water. And they do function as an ecological engineer. So they produce um, lots of burrows um, in the side of the banks, which creates habitats for various different plant species um, and other small realms as well. Um, they're part of the same family as bank voles and field voles. And they're quite chunky um, in their sort of size. Um, so there are, they can weigh up to about 300 grams and yeah, between 14 to 22 centimeters and with quite a long tail that can get up to 14 centimeters long as well. Um, in the wild, they can only live for about five months. So like a lot of other small mammals, it's very much live fast, die young um, as a life history strategy. Um, but in captivity, they can live for up to two years. Um, and they are, um, endangered within um, Great Britain. However, this is sort of stratified um, by country slightly. So in Scotland, um, they're a little bit more um, well protected um, with a lot more available habitat. Um, however, in England and Wales, they are endangered. You do find water voles um, in Europe and actually in France, they're considered a pest. Um, so there's actually culling um, in operation in, in France because they do damage a lot of crops. That's a slightly different story here um, in the UK. Um, so why are they important? I guess um, this is kind of the big the big story really is um, the population has declined um, quite significantly, 90% since 1970. And there's um, further declines that have been observed between 2006 and 2018. So about 26% further decline. This is mostly due to habitat loss. Um, so a lot of the areas along the UK waterways are just not suitable. The banks have been repurposed and um, water channels have been diverted and that's changed um, available space for them. Pollution, a lot of um, pollution in UK waterways, as we know, the amount of sewage um, has increased and um, that's been running into our waterways um, and obviously off run from, from farms. Um, and other sort of industry as well is really, really harmful for them. And a really, really big one is predation by invasive mink. So North American mink um, came over in the 1920s in fur farms um, to, to make those um, mink coats that, that were all the fashion back then. Um, but during uh, a few years later, a lot of animal rights protesters wanted to um, release them. So they release them, um, but the mink don't have any natural predators and they have a very high appetite. So they basically go around and eat anything in their path. So I think it's estimated that a, a mink could destroy a water vole colony within 24 to 48 hours very, very easily. They are just a very rapid predator. They can get in anywhere into the burrows um, and they can swim, they can climb. Um, yeah, so not great to have these about for our water voles. So looking to Cheshire and um, how our waterfowl sort of doing in this county, um, there has been a long-term monitoring project by Cheshire Wildlife Trust, and they've found that the trends replicate what we're seeing across the UK, so that waterfowls disappeared from about 56% of the previously occupied sites within the northwest lowlands. So you can see the two maps down here. We've got a heat map um, showing where we have positive surveys um, annually during this time when they were doing this monitoring project and the estimated number of waterfalls per 100 metres as well. So there's some, some bigger colonies to the north between Liverpool and Preston, uh, but there are a few patchy ones um, around just around Chester as well. Um, this work is continuing, so they do annual um, surveys at their managed sites and there's a lot of habitat 
improvement that's been um, happening as well. So when this project um, was completed in 2011, um, a lot of habitat improvement took place at about 14 sites. So this um, included changing um, bank structures um, and vegetation management as well. So if there was a dominant species that was um, taking up room for other species that the, the voles would like to eat, they could uh, manage that appropriately and mink control as well. So they are um, trapping and, and culling mink at, at sites as well to ensure that the water voles have a very good chance of surviving. And the way that they did this, they were looking at the trees. So this is kind of the, the national um, survey sort of standard as they use these latrines so the waterfalls will mark their territories in these big piles of poo as you can see um, in that lovely picture in the corner. Um, so this will give you an estimate of how many voles are in the area using these latrines as a sort of proxy um, for the for number of individuals because it's quite difficult to obviously go out and count individual voles um, easily within any of these territories so that's what they use instead. So my research, as I say, I'm in my second year now, so this is kind of my main data collection period. Um, so I've got a couple of different projects within that. So um, starting off with a UK-wide genome study, um, and then my Cheshire waterfall study, looking at um, trace DNA in the water to model waterfall abundance, and looking at scent communications as well. So using these latrines and scent, scent deposits that the waterfalls leave to understand if, if they communicate to each other and potentially avoid inbreeding through that as well. Um, so today I'm probably going to just mainly focus on those first two things because that's what um, I'm working on at the moment. Um, but if anyone has any questions about my other work, I'm more than happy to talk that through as well towards the end. So um, I'll just introduce you to my survey sites. I've got three um, active survey sites that I'm, I'm out and about surveying at the moment. However, the chances are that I'm going to have a few more um, sites um, as we go on as well. Um, so Ince and Gowie uh, towards um, Ellsmere Port kind of way. Um, Gowie is um, a publicly um, accessible nature reserve. Um, so you can go and have a look at this site if you wish. Um, you can have a look on the Wildlife Trust website and find the information there. Ince is just um, up the road. That's managed by the Wildlife Trust, but it's not owned by them. And Chumley is actually a private estate, um, which you can again uh, visit if you wish, but um, again, managed by the Wildlife Trust, but not owned by them. So those are my three sort of core sites, but I'm hoping to go and sample um, some other sites as well, um, potentially over, yeah, other side of Chester, um, but that's sort of waiting to see if we've got any signs of water wolves there first. We know at these three sites that there have been um, continuous um, signs of water voles over the last few years. So we do know that there is a population at each of these three sites. So yeah, why is my research important? Um, why am I doing this um, is what I get asked a lot. Um, so as I mentioned before, they've had that massive, massive population decline. So there's a lot of species recovery techniques um, that are happening at the moment. Um, so we can have uh, reintroduction and reinforcement. So these things are happening actively across the UK to make sure our waterfalls um, are, are being able to recover from those declines. So reinforcement is translocating individuals uh, within their natural range. So the, the aim of that is to improve the population viability and increase the population size, genetic diversity, um, and evening out the representation of demographic groups or stages. So if you've got a population that's particularly old, um, you want to introduce some younger animals into that group to ensure that they're going to have a good chance of, of breeding and successful um, longevity within that population. Um, reintroduction is a translocation of animals from outside their natural range to areas where they may have been lost. Um, so that's when you're re-establishing a whole population uh, within its natural range. Um, so both of these strategies are happening. Um, mostly within Cheshire at the moment, we're looking at reinforcement, but there's an element of reintroduction as well. So um, using the historical records, um, which record have provided um, to a lot of conservation organizations, it's really important to understand where our animals um, have previously been and how we can connect up um, different populations as well through reintroduction and reinforcement. It's just frozen, sorry. There you go. Okay, so um, we can also use assisted colonization and ecological replacement. Um, so again, this is looking at 
assisted colonization is where this animal's not been before, but we want to um, benefit the conservation status of the focal species outside of its range. So this is looking at climate change in particular. This is something that where um, if we're modeling climate change and we're thinking that there might be some more suitable places for these animals in the future, we can start setting up populations there. So in the case of the water bowl, it's looking at flood risks potentially and looking at new areas um, that uh, they can colonize where potentially they might not have been able to um, before or looking where species might be at risk um, uh, and moving them outside of that range. And ecological replacement is where you're bringing in an animal um, for a specific ecological function. Um, so yeah, usually using a closely related species to perform um, an ecological function. Um, this isn't something that we're reusing for the water bowl, but um, there's a lot of other species in the press that you might have heard that, that they're using this for. So I'm obviously looking at genetics. So we know we've got all this presence and absence data. We know where the water bowls have been and are at the moment um, across Cheshire, but it doesn't indicate the population health or persistence, how long that population might be viable for. So what I want to do is assess the genetic variability and inbreeding across um, these waterfall populations across Cheshire and test if there's any negative impact of relatedness on reproductive traits. So if our animals are highly related to each other, does this mean they're going to suffer um, reproductively? And we also want to establish the genetic distinctiveness of our Cheshire waterfalls compared to other regions in the UK. So this is really, really useful for those things I just talked about, all those different methods that we're using um, to really bolster our populations. We need to understand if our water bowls are unique, whether they share a lot of traits um, with other populations so we can move animals about without um, introducing any negative genetic effects, which would obviously harm them down the line and means that they're not going to be um, around for as long as you want them to. So I'm using non-invasive sampling. Um, so this means that I'm not handling the animals at all. So I'm using DNA that's left behind by the animals so it can be collected without, as I say, having to catch or disturb the animal. So the three things that I'm primarily looking for are hair, feces and saliva or buccal cells, so cells from inside of the mouth of the animal. And this picture here is a little raft that I've got set up with some bait on it. So this was part of my um, trials that I did last year, last summer, as the weather was looking really glorious there. Um, so basically trying to understand if my, my water bottles were there. So it's literally just a piece of old sort of pallet uh, with some floats attached to it um, that I anchor onto the bank side. And it's got a wooden stake with a field camera there as well. So this is a motion sensor camera. So every time an animal is sort of walking past, it's going to trigger um, a video. So we're looking for obviously our water bowls, but it gives us a good indication of what other animals might be um, using this habitat as well. Um, so as I say, I trialled these at my field sites and got some really good results. Um, which I hopefully want me to show you soon. Um, but yeah, this is another one that's out. Um, in the field at the moment. So I've adapted it slightly this year. Um, you can see just on the end of this raft here, there's a clear plastic tube. And inside that, the little red, red blob there is actually some berries. So I've got a mixture of um, blackberries and apples there um, to tempt the water bowls into the tube. And that's how um, I'm gonna capture the hair samples from them. There's a bit of sticky paper at the top. So the water bowl will walk through the tube to, to access the food. And the sticky paper will just um, take any hairs off the back of the bowl as it's walking through. And hopefully this will all be captured on the field camera that I've got positioned there as well. So uh, this uh, is a little video of um, one of my rafts last year. Hopefully you can see um, we've got a little bowl uh, walking along the raft here. You can see the end of his tail. Um, he's got a little bit missing. Um, so that was quite interesting to see that um, I could tell the difference between a couple of different individuals, but you can see uh, from the front of his face that he's got that quite blunt face. So he's definitely a vole rather than a rat. He's looking at the camera there as well. Um, but yeah, so then they were quite happy, quite curious to investigate the raft um, and sort of go in and out of the tube. And we were able to collect some, some really good samples from there. Uh, but equally, we can use this um, to understand their behaviour. Um, so that's where my scent deposit work will come in a little bit later. I can understand if they're leaving scents for other bowls, if there's several bowls using the same area, if they're communicating to each other um, through that scent, hopefully I'll be able to capture some of that um, on the camera. 
just investigating the food there as he's going through. Um, so yeah, similar to, to other rodents really, quite quite curious and inquisitive to new things, um, which is really, really beneficial for, for our research. Um, however, it does have its, its downfalls uh, with the camera. You, you sometimes pick up animals that you, you weren't necessarily looking for, and it takes quite a long time to look through all the camera trap uh, videos. Um, this was one that I actually recorded um, earlier this week, so just keep your eyes on um, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, and you might see another animal coming to visit. So just here you can see we've got an otter, um, which is amazing. Otters are one of my favourite animals, um, so it's really fantastic to see them on the camera, but not when they're moving your raft about like this. You can see it all bobbing up and down. So I came to um, check the, the raft later in the week and all the food had um, come out of the tube, but there wasn't any evidence of, of water bowls. So I wanted to see what's going on. Obviously this otter has been a little bit curious um, and has moved the raft around and that emptied it of, of all the food that was inside it. Uh, which is a bit frustrating, but always interesting to see and good to understand the other animals, as I say, like otters um, sometimes may predate water voles, um, but there's, there's also shown to be a link between them displacing mink. So where you've got otters, quite often you won't have mink. Um, so that could be a, actually a positive sign um, for our water voles. And as I say, even though they do predate on water voles, they don't predate them to the same extent that mink will. Um, otters will primarily go for um, for fish um, and amphibians and things instead, they're a little bit easier to catch. Um, so hair sampling, so as I say, once those water holes have gone through the tubes, um, we collect the, the hair off them. Um, so this is kind of the inside how it's set up. It's just a bit of plastic uh, with some double-sided sticky tape um, on the edge of it. So this is based off um, some previous research um, that another researcher had done um, where they, had, they, they left sort of tunnels like this out along the bank side. Um, but obviously they've got other animals going in and out of that. So I wanted to take this to the next step really and try and exclude some of those other animals a little bit. Um, so that's why I'm floating these out on the rafts in attempt to kind of just and make sure that we are getting our target species um, through these tunnels. And what I'm left with when I go and check um, is these, these bits um, that have stuck their hairs to it. So you can see Usually you get sort of a couple of clumps, um, long sort of brownish hair. Um, hopefully then you use the camera trap images to, to double check that that is a waterfall that you've got. Um, the, the only possible other animal it could be is a rat. Um, so that's why, as I say, this camera trap image is really useful to check which animal you've got. Fecal sampling is the, the other method uh, that we can use. So, Again, this is where the rafts are quite handy, actually, because they serve this double purpose. Um, as you saw those pictures at the start, when I was talking about the, the previous surveys that have been done across Cheshire, water voles love to latrine to mark their territory. Um, so it's really good to have these rafts out and about because they use that as another source of latrining. Um, so I can really easily pick these um, fecal samples straight off the rafts put them into a tube and take them back to the lab and we can get DNA from that. So those are the cells that have kind of moved through the gut of the animal. Um, and we can take the, basically we get the cells from the gut, uh, from the, the poo samples basically. And um, so they've done lots and lots of work on this um, in all sorts of different animals. Um, so we know that this is a really good source of DNA. It's just, there are a few problems, unfortunately, with all the other things that you get in the poo and trying to make sure that you get the things that you want from there. So your target species DNA rather than any other DNA that might be present in that. Um, but I'll come on to that in a minute when we talk about what I do in the lab. Um, but as I say, fecal sampling is really, really good um, for water voles because um, that's the primary reason um, people go out and survey, they look for the signs um, of water vole latrine. So that's the easiest way to collect DNA. So the thing that I'm kind of trying to work on at the moment um, is the buccal or saliva sampling. So this is a method that they've used for various different other animals. And I did um, a master's a couple of years ago at Chester Uni using uh, buccal swabbing to look at Nashjap toads. So um, as I say, it's, it's a good source of um, DNA. However, it's trying to find a way to get that non-invasively is slightly challenging. 
um, because you can't really just ask them to, to chew on something and leave it on the side for you. Um, so we've got to devise um, a method um, to collect that. So this picture here, we've got the water bowl sitting on the edge of a bucket. This was at Wildwood Trust in Kent. Um, so it's a native species um, facility. You can go around as a visitor and see they do a lot of work on rewilding, uh, but they do have a lot of water bowls. So they either take them um, to keep them in quarantine. So if people are doing a lot of work, like housing developments have to mitigate for that. They will quite often trap the water bowls and move them somewhere else. But in the meantime, they can take them to Wildwood if it's convenient and quarantine them there while they find a new home for them. But they also do a lot of work on reintroduction, so they do captive breeding of waterfalls here as well. So this is where I tested a lot of my um, methodology on these captive waterfalls. So the picture on your right is um, one of the same tubes as I used before, but it's just got some sterile nylon string on it. So the idea is the vole will chew through this to access the food. Again, apple, blackberry tend to be the favourites that they go for. Um, and from that nylon string, we can try and get some of the DNA off that. Um, it's a little bit more challenging as obviously you're, you're not guaranteed that an animal is going to expend its, its energy on chewing through that to get food when they could just get it um, from, from the bank. The usual sort of things that they eat will be grasses, sedges, um, plants of all varieties, but over 200 species of plant that they will eat. Um, particularly during the spring summer months when there's, there's a lot of food abundant um, in, in the habitat. So um, it's making sure you've got a really high value reward that's going to um, be worth the effort of them chewing through that and then to collect the DNA uh, from that as well. So yeah, the sterile nail and string idea came from somebody who'd done some work um, on bush babies and they left that out up in the trees and the bush babies would, would chew on the string that had different um, sort of sugary substrates on. So I think they used jam and peanut butter and they were able to get um, DNA from that. So that's the idea and I've trialed it, um, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit as well in the lab and seem to have worked. Um, but it's just, as I say, trying to make sure you're not getting anything else contaminating that as well. Um, so here's a bonus picture of a water bowl inside a Pringles tube. Um, so this is one way um, which they handle them when they're doing this captive breeding work. This is, again, this is a wildwood. Um, so you can see, yeah, the water bowls, um, but fairly chunky, um, but yeah, they're still pretty small. Um, and the Pringles tube is actually about the same kind of diameter as the um, uh, the tubes that I'm using, because that's about the same diameter as the burrow. So they're quite happy to um, go in and out of that kind of size area um but yeah just one last cute picture so yeah going on to the extraction technique so i've got my samples from my my field site so i now want to try and extract the dna um, from these different sample types um so i've been trying to find out which methods are best um so i've been using commercial dna extraction kits so these are the things that are used in labs up and down the country for human um, dna extraction as well as animals so use um yeah, in human uh, crime studies, um, in, in parentage assignments. So when people want to do sort of a DNA test um, to find out the parents, that's, that's what they'll probably use one of these kits. Um, as I say, forensic and wildlife crime as well, um, they're using the same kind of DNA to work out where um, an animals come from if they're not sure. Um, so they all kind of take similar steps. You can take your sample, you liaise it, so you're basically bursting the cell open um, to get to the DNA, and then it will bind um, to a silicon membrane, and it's a couple of steps of washing it and then eluting the, the DNA at the end. So you, your end product is the pure DNA, which you can see from this picture on the top right hand side. If you've got really good high quality DNA, you can actually see it inside your little test tube. Um, so it looks like this kind of, yeah, cream kind of little substrate at the bottom there. Um, that is pure DNA. Um, so yeah, three different commercial extraction kits um, is what I've been using. Uh, one of them is specific for fecal samples. The other ones um, are quite broad range. And then there's another method of using ammonium acetate for hair samples as well. Um, so I must just mention that all of this work that I've been doing at the moment, um, well, the initial kind of trials have been happening at Sheffield. So this is the NERC Environmental Omics Facility, NEOF, um, that I visited earlier this year. Um, so they specialise in, in environmental DNA. Um, they've been able to get some really amazing results from very, very little um, material. So that's why I went up there to kind of get a bit of help from them, um, because my supervisors in Liverpool work with a lot better samples than I'm currently working with. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to visit their lab and get their help for this. 
Um, so after we've got the extractions, we want to do PCR. So this is amplifying the DNA that we've got. Um, so we're, we're making sure that the DNA that we've got is from the animal that we're interested in. Uh, we're amplifying it up because it will be in very, very small amounts. And we can understand different cycling conditions for our different sample types. Um, so as I say, I've got those three different sample types. They might just be slightly different um, in the conditions that they need um, to, to amplify the DNA perfectly. So I've been using some conditions that have been published previously. So this Baker et al. study, um, she was the, the girl who did the initial um, hair sampling methodology. So when I talked about those tubes before, um, that's a variation in what she's done. Um, so I used her PCR conditions as well. Um, so PCR is basically just kind of um, unwinding your DNA. So you're denaturing it and then you're annealing it to your primers. So if you have a look at this um, diagram in the left hand corner, you can see these primers and the orange bits that are attaching to a specific part um, of the DNA that you're interested in. Um, and it's amplifying up those bits there. So I don't want to go into too much detail because it's um, I find it very complicated, some of this stuff. But yeah, the primer sequences that we're using are the ones that have been published before. Um, so they're in this table here. So we're looking for um, anything between 210 and 310 base pairs. So relatively small segments um, of those DNA fragments that we're looking for. So that's ideal in this situation because with our environmental samples, they're gonna be degraded because they've been out in the environment for a long time potentially, um, and they're not um, from, from the animal straight in terms of um, they're not a tissue sample or a blood sample. So it's a little bit harder to get um, really, really high quality DNA. Um, so you're not gonna find really, really long segments um, in those samples. So it's better to have these short um, um, sizes that you're having a look at. And they're tagged um, with a fluorescent marker as well. So that means we can see them um, under different conditions um, when we look at them on a gel or we sequence them. Um, so that's what those tags are there as well. And we've got the different temperatures that they work at. So as I say before, it's trying to find the optimum conditions for the different samples with these um, different primers as well. So how did I know that it worked? We have to visualize it. Um, and ABI is just a method of sequencing that I use when I was in Sheffield as well. Um, so initially I wanted to run it on a gel. So this is usually what you just do is a first kind of check to see if you can see anything there. Um, it's agarose. So um, it's just a, a solution that you can make up and it sets as a sort of firm gel. Um, and then you run it through an electrical current. So the electrophoresis separates your DNA by its molecular weight. So as I say, we were looking for the molecular weight of those um, primers. So between 210 and 310 base pairs, ran that for about half an hour. Um, you can run it for longer or, or shorter, depending on the length of the fragments you're interested in. And then we had a ladder, which was um, up to a thousand base pairs going uh, in hundred base pair increments. So that's just to standardize, you know exactly what you're looking for against that ladder then as well. Um, so I can show you some of those gels. Here, so hopefully you can see there's the ladder on the left hand side um, and then in the middle, um, those brighter bands are where it's worked really nicely. So that's our positive control. And um, so our positive control was from a tissue sample. Um, so when I was at Wildwood, um, they had some animals in their care that died from natural causes. So I was able to take tissue samples from them. Um, so that's just to check that we know um, then our primers are working, it's definitely working on our water bowls, it's not bringing up anything else. Um, so you can see there's some hair plucks that have worked, um, and that was using the Kaya amp kit, and one using the um, acetate as well, and one from a blood and tissue kit as well, which is a lot fainter um, higher up here, but I have labelled them. So you get an idea of, of, of what you're looking for, you're looking for these bands that are meant to sort of line up with with the, um, the base pair size that you're looking for in the ladder there as well. Um, and again, this was looking at the stool kits. So these were my fecal samples that we we're looking at. And again, some of those work quite nicely. You'll see there's a couple of fecal samples where it looks like there's multiple bands. Um, so that is where there is, um, there's other things going on here, basically. It's not just pure water wall DNA. We've got other things that are contaminating it. So the big problem with fecal samples is um, other, sources of DNA in that sample. So it will be, um, it could be the plant DNA, it could be um, 
things that the water voles have eaten. Um, so occasionally they will eat an odd insect or two, so we might be amping up that. Um, it could be where other animals have got into that, so you know if you've got flies or something like that. So that's why you've got to be really careful um, with the, the fecal DNA. Um, so that's why that that kit that I was using now is slightly different because it had an extra step in it, which would get rid of any of these inhibitors. Um, so you could just get your pure DNA that you were looking for um, from your sample. Um, so yeah, some of these will work quite nicely. So hopefully that means that we can um, go ahead and use fecal samples in our um, studies with our Cheshire Water Force. So after checking it, I was like, okay, cool. There's a few things that have come up. Great, okay, we can, we can sequence it now. So sequencing um, is basically going to tell, look at um, those specific areas of the primers and we can tell if an animal is heterozygous or homozygous for that specific region of the gene. Um, so we're looking for different peaks. So if we've got one peak um, at the bottom between our expected size range, then it's homozygous. And then in the blue, if you've got two around two peaks around that, it's going to be um, heterozygous for, for that gene. So the more heterozygosity you have within a population, um, the more variations of a gene um, those animals will have. So that's meant to be healthier for them genetically. It's going to give them more chances um, to, to cope with environmental stresses and fitness, um, future, future fitness. So that can include anything from um, fertility and breeding and um, to coping with specific diseases as well. So that's kind of a, a broad a broad look at that um, and we can do that in more detail using various different markers as well um, but this was just to kind of see whether whether it worked at that stage. So as I say in the next steps I'm going to be using slightly different markers um, so it's not just going to be those were microsoft like markers that I'm, I looked at I'm going to be using a SNPs which are what says here SMP but um, we call them SNPs and basically they're just um, sections of the genome, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So we're, we're sort of amping this up to look at um, different levels of variation. Then they are the most common type of genetic variation. So about every 300 nucleotides on average, there's gonna be a slight variation between individuals. Um, and it really helps us looking um, at these specific traits that are inherited because our microsatellite markers that I looked at are non-coding regions of the gene. So they don't actually do anything um, in terms of what that animal is going to see in its day-to-day -day life from that variation. Whereas our SNPs will show us directly um, the areas that are linked to those fitness traits that I was talking about. So whether that is reproduction, whether that is defense against various um, illnesses and diseases, um, and things like that, we can directly link that so we can get a better idea of um, genetic health within our populations, which is really, really interesting. And the reason people haven't done that before is it's quite expensive, but equally, um, you need a reference genome for your animal. Um, and not all animals have been, um, have had their genome sequenced because again, it's a lot of work, it's very, very expensive. Um, but luckily in 2021, the water bowl had its whole genome sequence. So that means that we can now use these SNPs um, to have a better idea, better understanding um, of their variation, not just in our Cheshire population, but across the UK as well. Um, so there's been a little bit of work on this on animals in Europe, but um, not much in our UK population. So I'm really hoping that by using these different methods, we can get not only non-invasive samples, but non-invasive samples that will work um, at a genomic level. So we can really see in detail how those different population declines and crashes have influenced the health of these populations, which populations are more related to others and how we can mix them together and encourage um, a wider population across the UK to be a little bit more stable in the future. 